Hey everyone, I'm Raif Darazi, and in this video, I'm excited to sit down with our guest, Peter Krebb. Peter is someone whom I recently met over social media. He resides in the UK, has been living with HIV, is married, and has five kids. And recently, he decided to come out about his status. And after we chatted, it became apparent by listening to his story that, you know, being a father and, and a husband, a regular churchgoer, overcoming addiction, and a bunch of other hurdles throughout his life. These are all things that I know so many of you will be able to relate to and also draw inspiration from. So Peter, thank you so much for joining me. How are you? Oh, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I've come a, come a long way. There's a lot happened over the past three years. So uh, yeah, just uh, trying to play my small little part in uh, bringing about the end, you know, with the stigma that's attached to HIV. But uh, yeah, excited to be Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Well, thank you. And I know that, you know, um, you're not exactly used to doing this sort of thing. So I appreciate you stepping out on a limb and, and you know, going out of your comfort zone. Yeah. If, if you, if you knew me well, you'd know this is uh, completely out of my comfort zone, but <laughs> um, it's something I, I felt very strongly about certainly over the past, uh, past year, you know, um, I just couldn't sit in the shadows as it were and, and say nothing. I just want to play my part. Okay, well, let's. I'm going to start out with a question I ask all my guests, which is, what is your assessment of the current state of the global HIV AIDS epidemic? And feel free to answer that however you like. Um, not good, I don't think, personally. Um, I think the numbers are going up, if I'm, if I'm right. Um, and I think myself, I think that now it is treatable. Um, I don't think it has the same... Um, terrifying effect as it used to so people are still not being um uh, careful i was careful but still got it um i contracted it through sex um but i wore protection and still still contracted it so i've spoken to a few people over the past couple two or three weeks since i came out with my diagnosis and um some people it shops, some people it was like, eh, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it doesn't have the same effect as it used to, if you know what I mean. So um, I personally don't think it's, it's that good. It's not spoken about much anymore. And I, I really feel it needs to be spoken about more because um, it just isn't spoken about at all, really. I mean, to get the information I wanted to know, I went to YouTube and I found your channel and a couple of other channels. And that's how I've I've educated myself. And um, uh, and when were you diagnosed with HIV? Sorry, when were you diagnosed with HIV? Uh, twenty twenty one, October of twenty twenty one. Okay, so uh, fairly so recently. Not, yeah, fairly recent. Yeah, just over two years. Um, but uh, I don't really think about it much, if you know what I mean. I only really think about it uh, when I go to the clinic and have my blood work done. Then I get a little bit. A little bit anxious um i don't know why um the nurses keep telling me every time i go you know you're going to be perfectly fine you're not going to die of hiv it'll be something else you know when you're gray and old but uh i still do get a little bit anxious yeah well and i think it's hard to sort of deprogram decades of hearing a certain narrative about hiv even yeah. if you intellectually know better you know that i think that emotional experience sticks with you i think it's more so um i'm terrified of needles <laughs> okay so uh, <laughs> yeah that's not good for me um so yeah. um, I'm, I'm like a little baby when i go in there um uh, but yeah and i think as well just in the back of my mind i think it'll eventually it will go i'm scared it's uh there's going to be something terribly wrong there but uh i know there isn't but i shouldn't feel that way but um sometimes i do yeah well, it's, you know, totally understandable, I think. Um, what was your understanding uh, at the time of diagnosis? Were you, you know, a lot of um, people say that as soon as they're told, they think I'm going to be dead in, in a couple of years well, or something like that. Well, how, how about, about how, how it reactions? came about? I actually went to, the, um, to get tested was um, me and my wife are married. Like you said, I've been married for 20 years. We went through a bit of a tough time three years ago. And... Um, we were both unfaithful and um, I got an infection. Um, so I went to the doctors 
they said, we think you need to go to the, the sexual health clinic. Um, I told them everything that had been happening with me and my wife. Um, so we thought it'd be wise to go and get, get uh, you know, some blood work done and make sure everything's uh, tip top. Um, now, when I got to the clinic, they thought it might be gonorrhea or chlamydia. Um, but when the blood work was done, I got the results within a few days. It wasn't long. Um, they said, we haven't detected gonorrhea or chlamydia, but we have detected HIV. Mm. And for about what felt like an absolute eternity, which was probably only a few seconds, I thought, uh, well, it's, it's curtains time. You know, it's, you know, that's it. You know, I'm, I'm going to die. Uh, but very quickly, the nurse said over the phone, um, it probably wasn't best doing it over the phone. I don't think they should have called me in, I think. But um, it was done over the phone. And uh, she said, you're going to be fine. You're going to be OK. This is perfectly manageable. And as she was talking, um, it's, it eased, you know, I, I was instantly thinking of my kids. That was the first thing, my kids and my wife, you know, they're going to be left on their own. Um, I wasn't necessarily scared to die. I was just scared leaving them on their own. Um, that terrified me. Um, all the regrets, everything come flooding into my head with just, you know, just a few seconds. Um, but she put me at ease very quickly. Um, called me into the clinic, spoke me through everything. You know, you'd be put on some drugs um, to bring you down to detectable levels. Um, and that's it. They just, they told me, started educating me about HIV. Um, and that eased And so my... was there concern for your wife since you were diagnosed that she might she... have been exposed as well? Yeah, she got tested as well. She got tested as well. She's okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so you were put on medication. How how did how was that for you? Did you have symptoms or, um, or side effects? I should say. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, building up to that, um, before the diagnosis, I was feeling um, extremely fatigued a lot, and it would come mm. in in bouts. So I wasn't feeling like that all the time. Just out of nowhere, I'd feel extremely tired, uh, and I'm not just talking about a little bit sleepy. Um, the best way I can describe it is it felt like someone had put a syringe in me and just sucked all the life out of me. Just absolute chronic fatigue, like I've never felt before. Um, I was getting rashes as well. Um, I would get like these little lumps appearing on my body, just looked like pimples, and they just weren't going away. And I've had psoriasis in the past, um, which cleared up. I only had it for a few years. Um, and I thought it was the psoriasis, so I put it down to that. I had a little patch about so big come up on my hip and I was using the psoriasis creams and it just wasn't going away. So that was making me think hmm, something just doesn't feel right here. And I remember I used to be a window cleaner or self-employed, uh, pulled up to a customer's house one day and um, I couldn't get out of my van. I was feeling OK driving there and I got to the customer's house and I just could not get out of the van and I had to actually drive home. I just felt absolutely exhausted, got got into the house and went straight to bed, just lay down in my bedroom. And I was starting to get cluster headaches as well, um, just the headaches that would not go away. It uh, didn't matter how many paracetamol I took um, or ibuprofen, it just would not go away. Um, so there was some stuff building up to the diagnosis that was making me feel like there was something not quite right, but it, HIV wasn't even in my mind. <laughs> You know, I put it down to just getting older and, you know, I'm in my 40s now and, you know, um, I was working very hard, you know, um, I've always had manu manual labour sort of jobs, so I just put it down to that. HIV wasn't even, even in my thinking. Yeah, I mean, I was in my 20s when I had symptoms and I was already telling myself I'm just getting older. Because <laughs> right. people ask that, they say, how, they say, how do you, you know, how do you not even think about that? And I just didn't. And so I get it. I feel you. Yeah. Up until the age of 42, which was when I was diagnosed, um, I had a lot of trauma in my younger years. Um, I was sexually abused at a very young age. Um, I'm not exactly sure how old I was, but I think I was six, maybe seven years old. Um, now, that happened to me um, by one supposed a Christ Christian and someone who wasn't a Christian, so two different people, but both those people were young themselves. 
Um, I was probably six or seven. They were probably in their young teenage years. Okay. Um, but per, the, the, the person that was out of the church, was that was the worst of the abuse. And that went on for quite some time. I'm not sure exactly because I was so young. Um, and then just when I went into my sort of young teenage years myself, I left school when I was 15. Uh, so I was very young. I went into a, a man's world, if you like, into a factory, which I was not prepared for at all. Um, I went from high school, um, left school at 15, went into Were a you time. ever able to to talk to anybody about what you'd experienced as a kid? No, it, I didn't speak to anyone about it until I got into my 30s. I, 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 okay. told, my mom, I told my mom and dad, um, but I was, I shouldn't have been, but I was ashamed of it. You know, um, I was brought up in a, you know, in the eighties and uh, in the early nineties, and um, to my knowledge, then there was there was no one to talk to about that sort of stuff. It was all brushed under the carpet, that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Thank God, now things have changed, and there are places for for, for people to go and 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 you know and, and just get this out of them. You know, I think um, it's a fairly common reaction for kids who are abused or traumatized to automatically blame themselves yeah feel yeah. shame i'm still trying to unpick it all now you know and try and um, yeah. understand why i did certain things and um why i went down certain roads but yeah i mean i was brought up in a, ch in a church environment from the age of four or five my dad used to serve in the royal navy um, he did nine years in the royal navy and when he came out of the navy in 1979 which was the year i was born he actually bought himself out of the Navy um, because uh, uh, my mum was pregnant with me. And for about four or five years, he went through a bad spot himself, um, drank a lot, being an ex-sailor, and eventually started going to church. His brother actually brought him to church, and, and that's how my family started going to church. And my dad eventually became the minister of the church. Um, so there was a lot of pressure on me. Um, I was expected to act a certain way, be a certain way. And all the time I'm dealing with all that abuse that happened on top of being bullied sorry, relentlessly at church and at school for being the minister's son. I was also dyslexic as well. And there was no help for people in those days that were dyslexic. They just thought you were stupid or lazy. So you were diagnosed at that time as being dyslexic, but they didn't have any kind of treatment? There was no real support system there. So you just had to put up with it and um, do the best you could. I was actually put in a class with um, uh, mentally handicapped children, which obviously didn't do me any good at all. Um, so I went, when I left school, yeah. I went into the, the adult world, if you like, with absolutely zero confidence. I mean, none at all. I didn't know what I was who I was, you know, what sexuality I was. I, I just I had no idea and I wasn't ready for it. And um, because I'd reached a certain age where I could do what I wanted to do, I pretty much did. Um, started partying, drinking first. I didn't really like drinking. Uh, that progressed into drugs, you know, lighter drugs, and then eventually into it led into heavier stuff and uh, getting in trouble with police, arrested numerous times. It, it just spiraled and spiraled out of control. So you said you were in, in the workforce and it was very much different than what you were used to, hard labor. And then at the same time, you're falling into drugs more and more. Do you feel like that was kind of like your way of dealing with and coping with all the things yeah, you I mean, experienced I didn't prior? Know. I didn't know what drugs were at all. I mean, it started off with smoking, um, just trying cigarettes and smoking. And then, you know, the guys that I'm working with are twice my age. You know, I'm a 15 year old boy and these are 30, 40, 50, 60. Oh, you were 15. Men. Yeah, I was 15. Yeah. When wow. I started my first job. So I was out of the education at 15 years old. That was the, wow. you know, you left at that age then. So yeah, I went into, an environment that I was uh, not prepared for at all. So I was being exposed to things. I didn't even know what drugs were. I had no idea. I mean, things are different now. You've got the internet and, you know, uh, kids are a lot more grown up in a certain way. Um, started off with a cigarette first. I saw all of the guys smoking at work, so I wanted to try it. You know, you want to fit in. You know, my whole life I've been trying to find where I, where I'm supposed to fit in. So I was willing to do anything they were doing just to fit in. 
uh, and have friends, you know. And um, uh, so, yeah, it started off with smoking, then it started off with drinking, then weed, then ecstasy, cocaine, speed, you know, you name it. Uh, the only thing I didn't do was injectables because, like I say, I'm terrified of needles. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I pretty much did everything else. Yeah, I don't think there's much I haven't done, really. Um, and that led to getting in trouble with the law as well, uh, being arrested numerous times. It was all sort of drug-related. But, yeah, yeah. then I um, uh, met my wife. I actually How old started, were you then? I was 21 years old. Um, about six months before I met her to a year, I, I weighed about seven and a half stone. I don't know what that is in pounds, so you'll have to work that out yourself. <laughs> It's very Seven and long. A half stone. Yeah, I don't know if you can work that out, but two pounds. It's fourteen pounds for a stone. One hundred and five pounds. Jeez. So yeah. you, you weighed nothing. Nothing at all. How I'm tall are you? Uh, six foot. Oh wow! Yeah. So I was like a golf club. Literally. Yeah. Um, but my and dad's from the drugs. Big, yeah, drugs. Yeah, I would go on three, four day binges without sleeping and not eating a pretty much not eating anything at all. Um, Mum and Dad didn't know where I was, um, so they were worried sick. Um, but yeah, my dad said to me one day, I can't, and all this time I was working as well, I was still working even though I was doing all the drugs, um, always been working my whole life. Um, my dad said to me one day, how would you like to meet a, a real life gangster? And at the time I was a young lad, I liked watching uh, gangster movies, Goodfellas, all that sort of stuff. And basically what had happened was is a, a guy had started going to my dad's church and he was a, a monster of a man. I mean, six foot six and about 22 stone. I mean, he was huge. And um, he'd been deported from Canada. He'd done a 25-year sentence for murder in Canada. And he'd been deported uh, back to the UK because he was, he was originally born here. So once he'd finished his sentence, the Canadian government kicked him out and sent him back to England. And he came back to my hometown, which is where he was from, and started going to my dad's church. And he got me bodybuilding and got me off the drugs. Um, hmm. and got so your me... dad introduced you to him as, as a... So he was witnessing the path that you were going down and he introduced him as hopefully a he, way to yeah, my, pull you my out of it? Dad, my mum and dad didn't know exactly what I was doing, but they they had a good idea. Um, yeah. But they knew I was doing drugs. They just didn't know what drugs and to what extent. So, you know, my dad um, introduced me to him. I'm not going to name his name. Did he, um, like, have the sit down with you and be like, you know, look, I see what you're doing with your life. And oh, many times. To... But I didn't, okay. I didn't lift you know, my, 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 you know, God has blessed me with a with a. a good parents he really has you know um my dad has always so what, been there you said you didn't listen so what because I, i'm just thinking about when i was you know in my teens i was extremely rebellious too and my parents tried to intervene in different ways and i just wasn't having it either but i was yeah. so bullheaded about it that it just nothing got through to me so at what point were you like this guy is kind of cool or maybe i do want to listen to i think it's because it was coming from a different person and um he started telling me about his past and um, I don't really know. I think that's why I just listened. I think it was just because it was someone different. It wasn't my parents. Um, you know, my dad was, you know, he was trying to help me for years and years and years, right the way up to 42 years old. You know, he's never given up on me. But uh, I listened to this guy because he would lived sort of what I was going through. He'd done a lot of drugs and stuff like that as well. My dad had never touched drugs. Uh, my dad was, you know, a big drinker in his day, but... This guy seemed to understand me and he knew how to talk to me and um, he got me doing lifting weights, which was uh, hugely beneficial for me. You enjoyed it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it got me feeling good about myself because I was like a like a rake. You know, I was so skinny and I just felt terrible about the way I looked, everything. I hated myself. And um, he started building me up. I was doing it every day within five days a week. And I started to look pretty good, you know. Um, at the time, I think I was about 19, 20 years old uh, when I met him, roughly. You know, I started looking really good. He got me off all the drugs. I was still smoking cigarettes, but all the drugs had stopped. I wasn't drinking any alcohol at all. Then his wife came over as well. 
three months after John arrived, and she kept going on to me all the time about this this girl would be perfect for me. And I never thought anything of it because, um, you know, she lives four or 5,000 miles away. But eventually she came for a two-week holiday. She had a little girl, three-year-old girl, who's my eldest daughter now. I adopted her. And I took her out on a few dates. She was only here for two weeks. And we hit it off, you know, fell deeply in love with each other, got on with each other right off the bat, laughed all the time and watched movies. And she went back to Canada sold all everything she had, moved back here within three months, and we were married from three months of knowing each other, from, from meeting her. Wow. We were married within three months, yeah. And that's how I met my wife, and the rest is history, as they say. Yeah, uh, so you just knew? I knew, yeah. You know, we've had lots of problems along the way, trust me, but phew, she's the most important thing in my life, without well, a Well, that's the thing. You, um, you met each other at such a young age, and you're still figuring out who you are, and... I'm curious about the longevity of your relationship and how it how it yeah. sustained itself despite yeah. all of these hardships that you've both gone through. Yeah, I mean, when we got together and got married, we had a ready-made family. She had a, a daughter from a previous relationship and uh, she was only three years old, but I, I fell in love with her as well as Mary Jane, you know. Um, uh, she The first thing she said to me was, is that you going to be my new daddy? You know, and it broke my heart, you know, because... Uh, real father if you can call him that only ever met her once and um so i adopted her uh, she became my daughter and she's 25 now and then a year after that we had another daughter another daughter another daughter and then my son um so is, it, we is did... that the cap on the string of children 100 <laughs> <laughs> percent. let's just say i've been doctored <laughs> As we okay. call it here. I see. So, yeah. Well, you know, miracles happen. Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> no, no I couldn't true. handle any more. No, definitely no more. You know, uh, my eldest is 25. I've got a 20 year old, a 19 year old, soon to be 19. She's 19 in December, a 15 year old, and my son is eight. Yeah. So um, we never really had any time together. Um, so we kind of um, drifted apart a little bit as time went on and then sort of came back together and drifted apart again. And um, I never dealt with my demons, if it as, as it were, you know, my, my things that had happened to me in the past. Um, and also she had a lot of trauma as a child as well, which I didn't realize until we got together. Um, I didn't realize the extent of it. Um, so we both had a lot of trauma in our past that we both hadn't dealt with. And that affected our, our adult years. Like I said to you, I didn't know who I was, what I was, what, se what sexuality I was. You know, obviously I liked women because I'm, I'm married to a woman. But, um, you know, there was also an attraction there to guys as well, if I'm being honest. It wasn't until what happened three, well, almost three years ago that all of that just poured out of me. And um, we both found out that we were both cheating on each other. It's a long story, so I won't won't go into that. But we both found out that we were both being unfaithful. We were both brought to a point, right, you know, it was like someone was saying to us, what do you want? You can go down this road of separation or you can stay together and fight for it. My love for her has never wavered. Some may say, oh, well, you kind of loved her because you cheated. Well, you know, those people can think what they want. But I thought, I'm, I'm going to fight for this. I don't want this to end. I don't want to be living apart from my children. I don't want to be living apart from my wife. So it brought us both to a point where we just started discussing all of these things. She told me about things that, that have happened to her in the past. She told me um, who she really is. And I told her who I really am. And we spoke about these things. And it all just poured out of both of us. And, you know, we're now at a point where we know everything about each other. And it's such a, a liberating feeling. The Do you wonder why you never had that conversation? You know, a lot of people have said that. And I, can't, I don't know, you know, I was just too scared, I think. And mm. the abuse I went through, I was too ashamed to talk about it. And, and, and ashamed as well to express who I really was. Like I say, I was brought up in a different time, you know, where these things weren't spoken about. Thank God these things are being spoken about now. And not, not only that, I was brought up, in, brought up in a church. And I know you've had that experience in the church as well. So... It was a, a, an accumulation of all this stuff, you know. I was um, just a ball of emotions, just ready to explode, if you like. And uh, 
but thankfully we've been brought to the place we are now and things are better than they've ever been they really are i mean i feel so good and i think my life started at 42 that's the way it feels that's when my life started at 42 years old and i was diagnosed with hiv and uh, it wasn't the hiv that brought about the change the change actually started before i was diagnosed so all of this came out of myself and my wife before i was actually diagnosed with hiv the diagnosis came after the change so I don't want people thinking that HIV changed my life. Um, it's played a part, but the change started before the HIV. You could say in a way that HIV has saved me as well. A lot of people think, it, you know, if we don't take our medication, then yes, it will kill us. But in a way, I feel that has saved me as well. It's, had, it's actually had a, excuse the pun, but a positive effect. It, it hasn't affected me negatively. I'm in the best shape of my life. I'm stronger than I've ever been. I'm fitter than I've ever been. And um, I'm just loving life now. Really yeah, I am. think surprisingly to some, that's a somewhat common thing that I hear from a lot of folks that I talk to on social media and who respond to my videos is that, I mean, I've even said it's it's been a gift in my life in a way, my diagnosis. That's, and I, to be honest with you, Rafa, people. I, I wouldn't be without it now. I know that sounds crazy. Um, I, 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 don't, I can't me, explain why. It's, it's part it's part of me now, and um, I wouldn't be without it. Keeps me on yeah, my toes. I agree with what you said. It's not it's not the diagnosis and it's not the HIV that necessarily changes you, but it's the catalyst that takes all these things that were kind of just sitting there ready. It's like you have the ingredients for some some kind of chemistry to happen, and it's just yeah. missing one thing, and that one thing comes in, and boom, everything comes together, and you're off. You're off. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's that's yeah. how I look at it. Yeah, I mean, I feel alive now. Before that, you know, I've had a lot of, I've got a lot of happy memories. I don't want people to think that that my life before forty two was was all bad. It wasn't. I've got good parents that have always tried to help me. They have. We all make mistakes as parents. I'm a parent. I've made tons of mistakes. My parents have made mistakes, but they're still good people. And my dad, especially, and my mum as well. But my dad was always there for me always knocking on the door, if you like, and trying to get through to me, but I just wouldn't listen. You know, I wanted to do things my way. You know, we did have a bit of a strict up upbringing within church, so I think when I was old enough to do what I wanted to do, it was like a kid being let loose in a candy store. I wanted to try everything, you know, and I did. I <laughs> literally tried everything, but uh, I'm so happy to be where I am now. You know, I came out about my diagnosis, I think it was about two weeks ago. What I did was, is I gave my testimony in church, so I stood up in front, we're only in a small church, but I stood up in front of 100 people and told them about what I'm telling you now, basically. Well, let that. me just interrupt you for a second. What, how did you go, how did you go from, you know, the man that you are describing to us being somewhat reserved, keeping to yourself private in many ways to getting this diagnosis that was a complete shock to you and having to... I don't know, process all of that. And then suddenly you're in front of your church. Like, what happened? What what was that shift that happened there? I think, um, you know, I am reserved, very reserved. And, and um, the thought of getting up in front of 100 people or the thought of um, coming onto YouTube, it, it, it terrified me. And I am an overthinker. I will think things to absolute ridiculous levels. But watching people like yourself, when you came out about your diagnosis, you didn't really have anyone to back you up. I might be wrong there, but I remember you saying about your your, your parents and the church you're in at the time basically shunned you. Um, I didn't have that. I've, I've always had a good, you know, backup crew, as it were. But just watching yourself, watching other people and, and the people that have died from, from HIV um, and AIDS, I just felt like I, I wanted to do something, play a small part, however small it might be, but just try and educate people about HIV. And I can't do that if I keep it in the shadows, as it were. I need to come out with it to be able to educate people. So I pushed myself out of my comfort zone. Did coming clean to your wife about all these things that you had kept to yourself for so long and the positive experience of doing that kind of, I don't know, reinforce you wanting to speak out about your diagnosis in a way? Yes. You know, telling my wife everything, you know, was um, hugely liberating. And, and, and she, you know, I didn't know how she was going to re respond to certain things that I told her. 
but she didn't even flinch. You know, it, it was almost like she knew already. But, um, you know, when, when she found out about the HIV, she was there with me. So obviously it came as a shock to both of us, but that quickly settled down. And I, I, I always, you know, from pretty quickly after being diagnosed, I, want, I wanted to do something. But um, it's been a process over the past sort of two years of, of building up my confidence, building up my body first, because, uh, you know, I was in a bit of a bad way when I got diagnosed through drugs and things like that and um, just not looking after myself. So the past two years has been a process of change. It didn't just happen overnight. You know, the first was getting my physical self right, then my spiritual self right. Uh, and, and now I feel I'm ready to do something um, and just help my, my heart is with people. I want to help people. And that's what I want my future to be is helping people. I don't want to be doing these mundane jobs that I've been doing for 30 years anymore. I, I, I want to do something that I, uh, that I love. Uh, my dream eventually would be to have my own gym to help people with, uh, with addiction because I feel training and physical fitness is, is you know, I, I can't put into words how beneficial it is because it's helped me unbelievably. And I have lads train with me in the gym all the time. They ask me if they can train with me. Um, young lads that are pumping themselves full of steroids at 19, 20 years old. And it, it just breaks my heart to see that because uh, they just don't realise what damage they're doing. They want everything now. We live in a society where we want everything now. Building muscle, as you know, as a natural bodybuilder, takes time and a lot of dedication and a lot of hard work. And, um, yeah, I just Patience. want to help people. Patience, yeah, definitely. Consistency. And so how did it come about? that you were speaking in front of your congregation? What, what was that conversation like? And how did it go after that? I'm lucky enough to go to a church that, and I'm not what you would think as a Christ, Christian is, a Bible bashing, you know, lunatic. You know, if people want to talk to me about my faith, I'm happy to talk about it, but I won't force it on anyone. But um, our ministers, um, John and Joe, they're awesome people. They really are such brilliant people. Their motto is loving God, loving people. And they do. We've got all sexualities in our church, all colours. Um, they don't care, you know, and uh, nor do I. And uh, that's the way it should be. But I spoke to them, told them about everything that happened with me and MJ and my wife, told them about my diagnosis. And I just said, at some point, I want to give my testimony. I just asked them how they would feel about that. They said they're fine. They've got no problem with that at all. But just do it when I feel it's ready and when I feel I'm ready. My minister um, gave a sermon one Sunday and um, said they want to ask if there's anyone in the congregation that wants to give their a testimony, then please let us know. And, and we're going to have a Sunday service that is just for people giving their testimonies. And I thought, well, this is it. So I asked them and they said, go for it. And uh, I stood up there shaking like a leaf. Um, <laughs> But I, I did it. I calmed down after about five minutes and um, I, I told everyone and there was nothing. But uh, I don't know what I was expecting, but everyone was high fiving me afterwards and hugging me and kissing me and just saying, well done. It, it, and you must have, you're so brave. I had messages all the next week coming from people through Messenger and Instagram because um, it was watched online as well. And I'm still getting messages now. And that's not why I did it. Um, I just wanted to start that dialogue with people, you know, and this was a way of doing that. And I've had people asking me, you know, um, about HIV and are you OK? And are you going to die? Are you going to live? And this is how you get the ball rolling. And now I'm now I'm able to educate people the best I can with the knowledge I have. And that's why I did it. I just want to help people. So it's as simple as that, you know. Well, it's pretty amazing that they reacted the way they did. I know a lot of people watching probably are thinking, yeah, I could never do that in my church. And that would never. But this is this is what I'm going to do, uh, Rafe. This is what I'm going to do. This is my plan, is I want to start a dialogue within the church and start talking about things that get swept under the carpet, like sexuality, HIV. All these things affect everybody, you know, and um, people of whatever sexuality should feel free to come into church. That's my view. You know, I've read the Bible. Um, my understanding of it is is that all should be welcome. That was that's the teachings of, of of Christ. You know, is all are welcome. It should be above every church door. All are welcome, but unfortunately, it's not like that. And I've seen that because I've been in church and out of church for forty four years. 
So I've got a lot of experience. I've seen it all. I've seen all the good, the bad and the ugly in church. And there is a lot of good people. They're not they're not all bad. And you get that in every walk of life. You get a lot of scumbags and you get a lot of good people. And uh, I've met them all in church. But the church we're at, they are super good people. Really, really nice people. And they've been nothing but supportive to me and MJ and they've helped us out tremendously. But yeah, I want to start a dialogue within church. That's my plan. I'm actually giving a talk at another church in January. Uh, so I'm giving my testimony again in January at another church in, in the town. I've been asked to go and do that, actually. I didn't, I didn't ask. They asked me. I'm going to a place in Great Yarmouth in April next year called Teen Challenge, which is a, a drug rehabilitation centre. That's re It's a Christian organisation. So, um, and also another one in Leicester, which is a, a city in England as well. So the ball is starting to roll slowly. And, you know, if anyone watching wants me to, wants to talk to me or get in touch with me, then you're quite willing to give them my details and, uh, you know, hopefully we can get something going. But that's the plan, you know. I just want to do Amazing. something. And hopefully. your kids know as well? Yeah. What's, what was, has their response been like? When I told them about, um, I mean, I didn't just do this off a whim. You know, I, I spoke to my wife about it. I spoke to my parents about it. I spoke to my whole wider family. I went to speak to them first and, and told them about my diagnosis first because I didn't want them hearing it second or third hand. Um, so I got to them first, told them the situation, told them I'm, I'm only on one pill a day. That's how much HIV affects me. They can obviously see as well. I'm in the best shape I've ever been in. You know, I'm not perfect shape, but I'm in pretty good shape for my age. And um, so I did things I felt was the right way, telling my family first and then telling my kids why I'm doing what I'm doing. And at first they were a bit shaky about it because I think they just didn't want me to get teased or I was more worried about how they would be treated than myself. You know, I'm a big boy now, so I can handle it, but I just don't want my kids getting teased or or bullied because their dad's got HIV. And so they weren't concerned about themselves? Um, I think they were a little bit, you know, but the more I spoke to them about it and the more uh, I educated them on and why I wanted to do it, and, and you know, they're, they're okay with it, yeah. But I, I, I wouldn't have probably done it if they weren't, you know. Um, like I say, my family is the most important thing to me. And uh, I'm playing catch-up now, if you like. But, yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to know what they think. Um, I think that's important. Um, have you faced any stigma related to your diagnosis? Um, the first I faced is when I went to the dentist about six months after my diagnosis and I had to put down on a form that I had HIV. I handed it back to the lady at reception and uh, I don't know whether it's just my mind running but I almost ran out of the, the dentist shop because I didn't want to write it down and uh, I was very nervous about you know, at that early stage about people knowing, but I wrote it down, gave it to the receptionist and she was giving me such weird looks. And <laughs> when I went in to have my teeth cleaned, they looked like they were ready to go on a NASA space shuttle. I don't know if that's how they're supposed to dress, but they were literally dressed from head to toe. There wasn't a piece of skin exposed, goggles, masks, a big white all-in-one suit. And I just laughed. This was for a teeth cleaning. Another one was when I set up this channel, started posting um, just little clips of me training and stuff like that. Someone put a comment, you deserve to die, which I quickly deleted. And uh, yeah, so apart from that, I haven't faced anything yet, but I'm sure I'm going to. Uh, well, it's a shame that you would experience that in a, in a healthcare setting, which is where people are supposed to be the most educated and the most trained. Yeah, I found that I was actually having to educate them. You know, I did actually start, uh, yeah, I went for another checkup about six months after that for a fill-in. And the dentist was asking, he was actually pretty good. He was asking me questions about my, my diagnosis and how I am. And I started telling him and um, telling him I'm training and getting my life together and blah, blah, blah. And, and it, Was he aware of U equals U? Yes. Yeah. Okay. He was actually, yes. Yeah. Um, I think people still find that hard to grasp. I train in the morning, um, very early in the morning, and there's always the same group of people in there, and they all know now that I've got HIV because I'm, I'm pretty much telling everyone that I've got it <laughs> and what my plans are for the future and uh, well, what I hope they're going to be for the future. And um, um, it's all been positive. I think that 
if anyone has got anything negative to say, it'll, it'll be done behind my back. It won't be done to my face. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. I'm, I'm prepared for it anyway. You know, I'm sure there's going to be um, haters out there. There always is. But, you know, let them hate. Yep. Waste of time to worry about it. Yeah. It just, it just doesn't... Uh, just bounces off me. I'm pretty thick skinned. You know, I've been through far worse than, uh, yeah, getting faced with stuff like that. So, well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk and share and be so open about your life and all your struggles. And I mean, I, I know that you're aware at this point, but it's, it really has an impact on people when they can hear experiences that you've gone through that they have gone through as well. And the way that you have managed to work through it and come out the other side, not just survive, but you're really like living in your best self and thriving. Like I said, you know, my life started at 42. You know, my kids have got their dad back. My wife has got her husband back. My mum and dad have got their son back and my sister's got a brother back. And I feel like I'm now being what I was supposed to be. You know, I'm finding out what lane I'm comfortable in, what lane I should be in. And uh, I'm just, I'm discovering who I am. It's exciting. You know, I'm buzzing every day. You know, I really am, you know. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, to some people watching, 42 seems ancient, but it's not. It is. It's quite young, <laughs> actually. You have <laughs> some of your best years ahead of you. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Of course. Uh, for people who want to follow, I'm sure there's going to be people who want to follow you, your channels and your socials and stuff like that. Where can they find you? Uh, my YouTube is Peter C 46 and my Instagram is um, Peter C 106. You've got all the details for it anyway, so I'm sure you have. You've, yeah, you've I'll, I'll put all of this in the description box below the video once it goes live. And if you want to follow up at any time, then by all means, let me know. And what do you say to, to folks who are interested in fitness, are interested in bodybuilding, in really reclaiming their physical health, but are worried or have trepidation or, or what have you? Well, um, I started off um, working out at home to begin with, just to build my confidence up. For about six months, I, I worked out at home first and just got my body used to training again walking anything you know and then I, I just got myself in the gym and i was i was nervous but i just thought i'm, do, I'm doing it you know uh, i don't care what people think of me you know at the time i was uh really skinny when i went into the gym but now you know i'm one of the biggest guys in there you know and uh i've made loads of new friends through going to the gym it's not just a, a training thing i've made lots of new acquaintances and friends through going to the gym as well so you you are taking steroids or no? No, God, no. I'm not on steroids. No steroids. Okay. No, I just want no. to be clear for, for people watching so they don't assume, oh, well, he must be taking steroids. No, not at all. I mean, uh, I'm too terrified. I don't even take protein shakes. Oh, right. The needles. Yeah. The needles. <laughs> the needles. I couldn't do protein. No. You know, there's, there's pills you can take, uh, steroids, if you, want to, if you want to do that. But I wouldn't recommend it. You know, I don't... They're much I don't harder think... on your liver and your kidneys. Yeah, I mean, when I, I was using, um, I was having protein shakes, but my, uh, when I went to get my blood work done, the creatine levels in my kidneys were elevated to such a level that it, it scared the living bejesus out of the, the lady that was uh, testing my blood. So she told me to, to stop taking them. So I, I don't take any supplements whatsoever. Everything I put in my body is real, natural food. Um, I don't drink anymore. I don't smoke anymore. I don't take drugs anymore. I'm completely teetotal. Total. That's not because I'm going to church or anything like that. It's just my personal choice. You know, I've spent years abusing my body and now I'm looking after it. And so That's did a simple. doctor ever tell you, you can't train or you can't build muscle because you're living with HIV? No, I was never told that. I was never told that I couldn't, um, I wouldn't have listened to him anyway, but, you know, because I love doing it. But they, they, they did say it's better to do it as natural as possible, you know. So I, I, it's just my personal choice. I just don't take anything at all, you know, because I just don't know what's in it. I eat a lot of eggs. I eat a lot of meat. Just proper food, a lot of vegetables. I mean, you know, it's the balanced diet, you know. I'm not, I'm not anywhere near as strict as you are with your diet because I've got five kids. It's impossible. I had a McDonald's tonight. So um, normally I do the cooking at home. Um, so my wife said to me before I leave and come and do this with you, she says, you better get dinner sorted. <laughs> so 
I had to go out to McDonald's quick and get something. Normally, I don't eat that stuff. But... What did you have? A Big Mac meal. Mmm. Okay. It was damn good. <laughs> Listen, I've had my fair share recently, even. Um, no, but I really wanted to just, you know, harp on that because a lot of people watching, they get hung up on this idea that they can't build muscle, they can't go to the gym, they can't train just because they're living with HIV. Um, regarding supplements, again, the, physical activity and eating and eating right is applicable to everyone for the most part, I would say. Yeah. However, when it does come to supplements, it, it's definitely varies person to person for you. You know, it made your creatinine levels spike. For me, I've been taking supplements every day for, I don't know, the better part of a decade. And I haven't, I didn't have any reactions in my lab. So that's, that's a yeah. more personal kind of thing that you have to work out with your doctor. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not knocking anyone that takes supplements, you know, it's just my personal choice, you know? Yeah. I don't want to right hander off you either. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah. It's just my personal choice. You know, I, you know, I was putting all sorts of stuff in my body for, for years and I just like to know what I'm putting in and, you know, it freaked me out a bit when they told me the creatine levels were spiking in my kidneys. So I just thought I'm not, I'm not doing it. You know, I'm not, I'm not having anything. And, um, and you're doing fine effort. without it. Yeah, I mean, I've, yeah, like you say, if people tell you you can't build muscle, they're, they're talking absolute rubbish. Because uh, I've been training again now for three years nearly. It's about two and a half years. And um, I've gone from about 100, I've put about 60 pounds on since my diagnosis. You know, I've got, I'm carrying a little bit of fat, don't get me wrong. You know, I'm not shredded by any means. I'll never be shredded. But I've put a lot of muscle on and I'm, I'm strong. You know, I'm pretty strong. Yeah. And uh, so if anyone tells you you can't get strong and you can't, you know, uh, put muscle on there, they don't know what they're talking about. Just don't listen. But to it just doesn't mean that it's it. easy. No, don't it's not easy. Don't mistake what's possible for what's easy. It is, it is bloody hard work, you know, and it takes a lot of dedication, a lot of commitment. I'm in the gym six days a week. Even if I'm ill, I'm going to the gym. You know, I don't think I've missed a day. And I'm not I'm not exaggerating or lying at all. I don't think I, I can't remember I was missing a day apart from my rest day, which is on a Sunday. Occasionally, I might have a Saturday off if I'm taking the kids out somewhere or going out on a family trip or something like that. Uh, but I make it up in the week. Um, I'm training at least five days a week. I do it old school, chest on a Monday, back, you know, arms, legs, you know, shoulders. That's the way I train. And uh, it's working for me and I love it. So well, amazing. Again, Peter, thank you so much. Uh, folks at home, be sure to check out his social. You can follow along as he continues his bodybuilding journey and, and sharing his, his story with everyone. Please like this video if you liked it. Subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that bell so you get a notification every time a new video comes out. Uh, maybe one day we'll have a little follow-up with Peter. So please... I'm on Positive Plus One as positive well. Positive Plus One. Oh, right. That's the new app that I've been talking to you guys about. Awesome app. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Positive Plus One, it's not available everywhere. I believe right now it's available in the US, Canada, the UK, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand, but it will be rolling out to more locations as time goes on. And I will be sure to let you know when that happens. So please share this with anyone who you think might find value in this. That's the best way that you can help support me and my channel. Until next time, cheers. Take care, brother. I'm